frequency I have an accent, sometimes that's a little hard for people to understand. If I am talking too quickly or not clearly enough, just kind of raise your hands and then wave them around and I'll slow down. Uh, also, I'm, I'm going to give a presentation for about 40 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. During the presentation, if there's anything you want clarifying, please put your hand up. Don't wait around or I'll start to move really slowly. <laughs> Just put your hand up and we'll ask for anything that you want to discuss wider. In fact, can wait until after the presentation. And um, that's it. So it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, uh, the conference is really well organized. I'm really, I'm really enjoying the meetings with people. And it's a beautiful setting. Uh, so congratulations to the organizers. So I'm going to start with, with the presentation now. And what is your name? James and So that would be one of the first things that I've come to. So I was asked to talk about um, social media and activism and cultural change. So I was contacted back in April and I kind of drew up um, what I'm going to be presenting on then. And then when I actually came to make a presentation, I thought it would be better to be a little more practical. So it's not going to be, there's a quote here from Malcolm Gladwell which has been discussed a lot when talking about the Arab Spring and how, well this is actually about the so-called Green Revolution in Iran when people were around voting for a, a different leader and the results got overturned and he, he was quite critical of people describing it as a, a Twitter revolution. So this is, um, the, this quote here is basically just saying, uh, it's posing a question, yeah. is social media really um, what it's cracked up to be? Um, I'm going to look at that in brief, but then I'm going to look at some practical stuff about how it actually can be used to help you with your uh, reaching new audiences and continuing to engage with the audience that you already have. So, I am Digital Media Manager for Greenpeace India. I've been there since 2009. My, well, I'd like to put my own tagging on I wasn't born there, but I've spent the best part of the last 15 years in London, and I currently live in Bangalore for the last few years. I work for Greenpeace. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are aware of Greenpeace. This is, our, this is probably the strongest symbol of Greenpeace, the ship with the Rainbow Warrior that we use to, in the Southern Ocean to sort of track whaling boats and also uh, we use... Come in. It's no problem, you have a this. And um, also to, to go and bear witness to French nuclear testing on islands in the South Pacific. This is in Auckland Harbour in New Zealand. In 1985, uh, the French military found a mine on the ship through the side out of the same bit. Um, they didn't know at the time that one of the, one of the photographers had gone back to the ship at uh, that time. And so he, he died when, when the ship went down. And so this came up with saying, you can't see the rainbow. We just put the rainbow right there. And 26 years later, we, 27 years later, Greenpeace is still going to go. So in numbers, Greenpeace is 41 years old. It's been in India for 11 years. We've got a global community of 24 million people, 2 million of them in India. It operates in 40 countries around the world. And on social media, it's asked the theme of this call. Um, we have a community of more than 6 million people spread across those 40 countries. So as I was saying, back in April, when I was contacted by India Brown Minister to come and talk at this, at this conference, um, it was going to be all about the Arab Spring. And the brief that I'd drawn up was, was this. It's a bit of 
already. Um, um, I'm fairly certain that you're all aware that it's not going to be entirely about this. Uh, we will talk about it a bit. So this is just that, that was how this presentation started, and this is what it is evolving into. So it's very vague. What does, it, what does social media actually mean for us in our day-to-day -day jobs, trying to communicate animal welfare and animal rights to the people um, that we work with in our communities and trying to start a broader conversation about it our national So I'm going to focus mostly on tips on how to use the two main social media channels that we can talk about, which is Facebook and Twitter, how to get your message across, and how to grow a community of people who are committed to your course. Um, first of all, though, just a little bit about the hour of screen, because personally I find it fascinating, and I'm sure that some people here would have been wanting to know about it. Uh, and I'm by no means an expert on, on this. I've never visited the area, um, so please take this with a pinch of salt, leading from mostly social media. So this is Tahir Square in Egypt, which for many was the, the symbol of the Arab Spring, and kind of the, the symbol of the existence of where, where people came together on the streets to, to look for a new way of, of running the region away from the old democratic regimes. And if you, um, in the, what happened in Egypt and across North Africa, uh, it was it wasn't just, in fact, it was not primarily because of social media at all. The reason that change happened there was because people came out of the streets in large numbers and they proved a um, very old saying that people should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. The governments are only ruled because we allow them to. So they came out in such large numbers that the legitimacy of the government disappeared. Change that. But what role did social media play? So people were more aware of government corruption thanks to the transparency that the internet brings. Now it's WikiLeaks um, producing all these cables from American diplomats. And one of the main things that came out was about the regime in Tunisia and how the leaders. Whilst their, whilst their people starved and couldn't afford food, um, their leaders lived playboy lifestyles, jetting around the world, um, and people were, people were disgusted with this. But once again, uh, I mean, WikiLeaks is a type of social media because it's used to generate content, but we only have that information because of, well, because allegedly of a young soldier called Bradley Mann. And so that was, that, that was an, a real-world thing that he did, that social media amplified. But without him doing, you know, allegedly sharing that information, none of this would happen. So it took a real-world action. Social media didn't make any of this happen. It just amplified what happened. Lots of people wanted change, but they didn't scare. They were sitting in their homes, discussing with their families and their neighbours, maybe at the cafe discussing how angry they were about the situation. But the people felt alone. Whereas with the advent of social media and networking and sharing with people beyond your immediate social circle, people realized that the whole country and the whole region were in place. I don't need to be so afraid. The people were able to organize very quickly to get people out on the streets. Messages about there'll be a demonstration here about this spread around the world within literally sometimes 30 or 40 seconds, which meant that it was very hard for the authorities to come back on individual demonstrations because they could just move the location. And once it did happen, um, all of this information got out to the world very quickly. I'm sure we all remember those videos of people on camel back riding through the square, kind of attacking people. So kind of the pro regime forces. That was out within 15 minutes. So 
these things couldn't happen in a, um, in a vacuum, which was, which was very important for the external pressure that was applied on the Congress regimes. So now I'm going to move from this to talking more generally about social media. So what is social media? I'm sure that if you've ever been to any talks on social media before, you will have seen pictures like this. Groups of people connected by the music. And this is supposed to be, you know, this is, you're supposed to be aware of when you see this, I would never put it like that. But it's a very simplistic way to look at it. Social media is just the same as you and your friends sitting around anywhere, it's just you do it electronically. It's just a conversation between. And the most important thing that pictures like this don't get is that this person talks to this person, and this person talks to that person, and that person, and the node at the middle, what's the maybe the most important, is not the only thing. So when we're talking to our supporters through social media, when the stage you really want to get to is where it's not just a conversation between you and the supporter, and the supporter talks back, but your supporters start talking to each other. And one of them says, hey, there's this problem in my neighborhood that I want to fix. And you don't know anything about it, but another supporter does. And then he says, well, this supporter over here has skills we need, and we pull each other. The problem is solved without it ever coming to the middle. And that's the real power of this kind of thing. It's just getting together groups of people with shared interests to actually talk about the things that matter to you. So there's lots of other questions that people ask about social media. Is social media making us stupid? Um, can social media change the world? All sorts of things. I mean, I've seen ridiculous things like that. Um, kind of, is social media um, going to replace television? It's all sorts of things. Uh, but the one really important question about social media is, is it an important condition communication channel that you can use to reach your supporters. And I think that's probably why you're all here, because you want to know more about that. Um, can I just um, have a show of hands? Who here runs a uh, Facebook page or a Twitter stream? Yeah. Okay. So we all understand that it's something we should be doing. Okay. One person does. <laughs> no worldwide revolution. <laughs> So, yes, it is something that we can use to reach our supporters. But, and it's a very, very big but, and it's something very, very important to remember, is that you do not own the relationship through social media. So, if I can just illustrate that with Facebook, you get people to like your page, and that's great. You know, your posts will show up in their newsfeed, you can interact with them. But you don't actually know who they are. You don't have their email address, you don't have their phone number, you can't so you can't call them up and say, hey, we're organizing an event in your town. You can send a message. If they don't log on to Facebook that day, or Facebook's algorithm doesn't think that that's important enough for them to see, they'll know nothing about it. So you don't own that relationship. And Facebook can change things. Recently there's been a big fuss in the NGO community about since Facebook went public, how they have introduced promoted posts. And at the same time as introducing promoted posts, a lot of people are claiming that their reach has decreased. So some of them are promoted posts. Pardon? So when you, uh, when you post something on Facebook, like your status, but for your page, it will be an option to promote it. And you can, you can pay to make sure to get guaranteed reach to your community. Now, you never used to get guarantees to your community, but a lot of people are saying that the number of people that they reach through Facebook without promoting has dropped by about 50% since they introduced this. So basically, they're, they're using their algorithm to punish people into paying them money. Um, so you don't own this relationship. So, so they, can, they can turn around and change things any day. And it's worth bearing that in mind. It's worth bearing that in mind before you spend um, any great amount of resources 
on Facebook because it's not something that you control. If you can try and make sure that you get hold of people's email addresses and phone numbers, then that's much better. So I'll come back to that a bit later, but it's just a caveat that I want to add at the start, that you can get burned by this. So another question worth asking is, what do you want to get out of social media? Um, does anyone here know what they want to get out of their work on Facebook? But there is a little problem. On Facebook, there are so many fake identities. How yeah. can you... So many fake identities. You know, like one person maintaining more than one number of uh, accounts over there. Yeah. So how do you maintain this virtual relationship? This is a virtual world. Yeah. How do you promote your postings? You know, this is another problem. Huh? When you pay to promote... How, and the other end, you don't know who you are. Yeah. When you pay to promote things, you may not actually be promoting to real people. I think India is the country with the highest number of fake identities. Fake identities. So it is more of a problem there. But I think it's still less than 5%, even in India. No, 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 it's more than that. But that's a huge number considering how many people are in I think globally it's less than 1%. But they're the people. So, yeah, what do you want to get out of social media? Normally when I ask people this, they say. Um, so yeah, normally when I ask people this, they say, I want um, 10,000 likes on my page. Uh, or, I, yeah, but that's, see that's why you want 10,000 likes, which is much more important. So people tend to think just in terms of that number, but that's, that's the wrong approach to thinking about it. You need to think, why do I want those 10,000 likes? So one reason is visibility, another is, Come in. It's no problem. So community building is one thing. So what I mean by community building is that you've got maybe people who are interested in the work that you do as an organization or an NGO and you want people to um, you want a place where they can discuss things with each other. And where what I described earlier about that um, it's a peer sharing can take place. So that's community building. You're growing the power of that group of people that you that you communicate with, your constituents. They're becoming more powerful because they're networked on each other and condition. Then another reason might be increased traffic to your website. I mean your website will have some core functions that you want it to do, maybe writing donations, maybe getting email addresses, maybe getting people your latest newsletter, uh, maybe promoting events. So you can use social media to drive traffic to your website, which increases the value of whatever you're doing on your website. You might want to recruit volunteers. I mean, it's really a brilliant way to recruit volunteers because you can have that conversation with them. And then you can tell quite quickly who's stuff. This is kind of addresses the point that you were making. You can tell who people are who are not just real people as opposed to fake profiles, but people who have real interest in your work are not just there to, to click on the times, but are there to actually interact and they have their own ideas and you know they want to get out there and do something. It's a great place to recruit volunteers. Um, some people want to use it for fundraising. So far not many people have cracked um, fundraising through social media as a direct fundraiser. Uh, one thing that it does do though is that when you have regular donors, if you loop them into your social media communications, they're likely to A, give you more money, and B, stay with you for longer because they feel more valued and more involved. So it does have fundraising return on investment, but it's not a direct fundraising channel. Uh, it probably will be in two years' time. People, everyone is trying to unlock this at the moment. And I think some organizations in the US where payment issues are much, much easier than they are here are starting to make some more um, Another one, networking with influencers in your field. And um, this is something that Twitter is very, very useful. So there are people out there who then, they're not professionals. They're not, they don't work for an NGO. 
they, um, they do something else, like a day for. But in their spare time, they're very, very, and I'm guessing a few of you fall into this category, they're very, very knowledgeable about the issues that you work on, and they're respected by their peers because of that knowledge. So you can, you can find those people and identify them, and hopefully get them to them on the side of your groups. Um, I'll come to that uh, in a little bit, but basically, do we use Facebook for fun and Twitter more for information? So, which tends to be the difference between the two. So, those people are there on Facebook, but it's less easy to identify who they are in the crowd on Facebook. Whereas Twitter is much more about um, kind of passing on information that you have an expert in. So I'm going to look at Facebook for a while now and some tips on best ways to use Facebook. So the first tip I would give to anyone setting up a Facebook page is to establish some community rules. So they can go into a back section they can be as short or as long as you want, and, but make sure you establish them. Uh, our policy is to try and delete and ban as few people and posts as possible, to try and be completely transparent. But some things you do want to ban. Um, you don't want spam, you don't want people coming in talking about the environment, you don't want people coming on there and saying, hey, get the latest month of training is half price. It's irrelevant. You can delete that without any worry about upsetting anyone. Um, you don't want people coming on there and attacking other members of your community for their beliefs. You don't want that. Um, this is a grey area. Where do you draw the line on quote unquote offensive language? If you're doing hard, some people campaign, do hard hitting campaigns where you do use some provocative language. So if you say that no one is allowed to say anything too provocative um, in your community, if you're doing that kind of work, it doesn't work. So maybe you can just cover it all under the no being offensive to our community members. If you want to make sure that you've got a catch-all for anyone who's misbehaving, then you can just say absolutely no swear. Anyone who swears will be bad. Then most people who want to cause trouble for you will swear, and then you can automatically go well. Look at the community rules. You've got it. And that's quite an easy way to keep out of trouble. Uh, Greenpeace, we don't do that because we, every now and then there are games engaged in slightly more controversial and provocative campaigns. And it would seem a bit um, out of sync to then be kind of like a school teacher about you know, that language. But if someone does it repeatedly or unnecessarily, we will back. But we will also discuss with the community why we back the person. So they can't just say, oh, they just deleted me and they didn't. So the community knows what's going on. Then another question is, whose posts should you show? So should you just be posting your own content all the time? Or should you be posting that of other organizations? So um, I think research shows that about a three to one ratio is good. So like three parts of your own content the one part of someone else's content is good. Because it's social media, it's about talking to people, it's about building relationships. Why not build relationships with other organizations like that? You share their post one day, they'll share yours in the future. And that will help grow your reach. Everyone wins. At least that's the idea. So, um, yeah, so do think about who else, who else in your field is doing good work and um, doing stuff that people like. If you see something that you like as a person, you can ask for it. And it's relevant to what you're doing, then share it on your Facebook page. Your fans will probably like it, and the person who produced it might do the same for you in the future. Um, if you have time, now this, this is very time intensive when you get to be a big community, but try and answer every single thing that gets asked of you. And that's the quickest way to build community. 
people will respect that claim nonetheless. It shows a, it shows that you actually care for people, that it's not just by kind of standing there with a megaphone chatting to people, you guys have decided to like my page, now listen to what I said. It's actually saying, you guys have joined my community, I want to know what you think. Well, you think that, that's pretty interesting. Have you thought about this? Even if someone is being critical, and this is something we found over the years, respond to them, and if you can find anything positive in what they said, respond and say, you're obviously an expert on, even if you think they're completely wrong, that they made one point that shows they know what they're talking about. Say that, I know that some hostility melts away, and we've actually got some people who now volunteer on Brandon's, who started off coming on our Facebook page and saying, Three weeks of rubbish, why do you do this? You don't know about that, you don't know about that. Um, we engaged with them and now they're actually active volunteers with us. So some of these people they're just they're doing it to get attention. They're doing it because hey, come in. So yeah, they're doing it because they want attention and because they feel that they have something to add to the conversation, but they don't know how to start on it. So if you respond to everything, um, the community runs a lot better. This is, this is very important. Don't post too often. Can I um, just pick some, someone who has, um, who runs a, a Facebook page? I think the person one of a group of uh, An organization page. Okay, so how many times a day do you, do you post? Not every day. Not every day. Okay, that's yeah. definitely. Once in two days. Okay, that's definitely not a lot. That's good. Anyone else? Yep, we post a lot of things. How often do you post? Um, once in two hours, three hours. <laughs> that is, that's probably over the yep. People are probably going to look at their news feed and go, these guys are here all the time, I want to hear from my friends. And um, some people will... But yeah, you can say like it's not just like one related topic which is going on, it's like a lot of other things. Yeah. The post that's going on, so it's like a little different. We, I think general best practice is twice a day. Uh, we post we post between three and four times a day on our page, um, but we monitor both, and we think that that's what our community can take. Uh, the more people start doing this, the kind of harder it gets for everyone, so we need to start posting a bit less. But three or four times, up between two and four times a day is the absolute maximum. And that should only be if you have quality content. If you don't have quality content, then don't, then don't post it. Um, the once every couple of days, I would say that you should probably increase your least once a day. This is actually a group. Ah, a group. Okay, so the, others also yeah. get posted. Okay, so the dynamics are very different. You know. uh, I think the groups, they're limited to 5,000 people. Oh, we have around 1,300. So if you're looking to grow beyond 5,000 people, um, the group model doesn't work. So I don't actually know that much about the group model. We have a page of So for your page, you probably want to be trying to post something each day, as a minimum. And definitely no more than four times a day. Unless you have like some, as I think we do these actions where you know, we'll have sell down building, with the yellow banner with our message. When we do things like that, we might do something every half an hour because it's a kind of live event on television. Yeah, so you know, during the time of our meetings, we will obviously like the client goes and has the story something like that. And could that be the good thing? It depends on the magnitude of the breaking story. One thing I would say is Twitter is much, much better for breaking stories than Facebook. The community on Twitter is smaller, but they're the kind of people who want great news. Whereas Facebook people want entertainment. So a couple of roundups of the breaking story every couple of hours on Facebook would probably work a lot better. Um, the next thing is know when to post. So there are certain times of the day that work better. Now, I'm guessing not many of you have truly global audiences. So you're talking about times of the day in Indian time, which is the same as we are. So 
we find that the best times are around uh, 8 in the morning in the check before they go to work. Around 11 o'clock in the morning, people get bored midway through the morning, go for a coffee break, um, whatever. Around 2 o'clock, so towards the end of lunch, people just check their Facebook before they get back to work. Um, around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, and then maybe about 8 or 8 o'clock. So expert, they're probably the sweet spots. So experiment with which ones work for you, and bear in mind about how often to use. So some, don't put something at 3 in the morning. That wouldn't work. But these spots in the day, before work, mid-morning, after lunch, end of the working day, even time, are the ones that work best. And then, know what to post and what to say. So that's very important. Because you can get all of this right, but if you're not posting the right kind of content and saying the right kind of things, it won't have that much impact. So, you know, give you a bit of information on that. So, okay, I mentioned about posting content that's not your own. And if you want people to like and share your post, then say, please like this and share it with your friends. And do you know what? About twice as many people will like it and share it with their friends than if you don't say that. Very, very simple. Another thing is if you ask people a question, you invite a response. So you get comments. And the more comments the post gets, the more Facebook things. This is interesting content, it should appear in people's newspapers. So if you say, please like this and share it with your friends, and by the way, what do you think about issue X? Give us any examples you've come across in the comments section. People will like it, they'll share it, and they'll comment on it, and more people will see it. So that's, that's very useful, to, to just remember those things. Ask people to do things. If you want people to do something, you have to ask them. You don't just stick a picture of, of something and hope that people will do what you want. You need to give them some instructions. Um, you need to know what kind of content works best. Now, there's a very, very simple answer to this. Um, the answer is, wait for it, that images work best by a long, long way. If you post a link or a video on, um, on our Facebook page, if it does well, it might get 100, 150 likes. If we post an image and it does well, it might get 2,000 or 3,000 likes. How many, how many likes are on the page? Uh, we have a community of about 8,000 people on the community page. So, Images do so much better than any other type of content that we almost never post anything but images. They do about between 10 and 20 times better in terms of the number of people they watch. Yeah. Very important things. 
So there is a difference between how many people like your post and how many people your post reaches. But if your post reaches a lot of people and doesn't get many likes, it means that they ignore it, that they haven't chosen to interact with it. So probably not so good. Um, but the two generally correlate. So um, if anyone wants to write down this, it's quite a long web address. There's some very useful information there about what kind of content NGOs post on their, um, and specifically environmental NGOs, uh, post on their Facebook pages and what does well for them. And the good news for you guys is that images and animals do very, very well. Yeah, they're the most, they're probably the most shared in the top line. So just to give you an example, here's a cat playing with this little cat. Uh, it's actually just a cat standing on its hind legs, but I'm sure you're all aware of the long cats phenomenon. Take a picture of a cute cat doing something funny, stick a caption on it. Uh, it's one of the most popular things on the internet. And the same holds true for lots of other animals as well. So, very easy to engage people with the kind of content that you guys should have with your fingertips. If you just add a comedy caption to it, it'll probably double how well it does as well. Can everyone get that URL? I'll just get that. Or you can do it. Or you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, it's, it's alright. I can wait a minute. I'll just check how I'm doing it. Can I ask a practical question there? Sure. Can we also post pictures of animals that are not fit? I mean, an animal welfare that works sometimes with yeah. animals which are not fit at all. Yeah. And that works as long, really as, well. as, long as it's a good photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as you can make it interesting. Yeah. So images with one way to make images interesting is images with text. They do very well. So here's a picture of some sushi that's kind of nice and plastic because we throw too much plastic in the ocean. It all ends up there. There are huge plastic sticks. I think one there's one in the North Pacific besides in Texas. That's, so um, you see the image, but then you get the text. It's part of the image. So what a lot of people realize is they want to get a message out. And instead of writing it on Facebook, if you put it into an image, a lot more people will see it. Images of few animals. This is an image that did very well. Um, it's, it's also a very nice photo. So high quality photography is, is really, if you're going down the content strategy based mostly on images, you need high quality photographs. And the chances are, in terms of your community building, that you have people in your community who are good photographers who like taking pictures of animals. So the community can produce the content itself if you're smart about it. And then also, um, sadly, and kind of coming back to what, what you said, images of animal suffering connect to very strong emotions. Sometimes people don't like it, but generally people get this feeling of outrage and this is not right, I want to change this, I want to tell people about this, this can't happen. So here's a picture of a bird that's all the kind of plastic fishing lines and stuff that are in, in the sea. Um, again, from the same campaign as the sushi. And that's very, very sound but powerful image, which communicates the message very effectively. You don't need anything more than, than a couple of words there to tell you what this is about. Don't do too much, then people Yeah, you don't want to just be posting images that people find upsetting. Yeah. Otherwise they will leave. Yeah, they but you can post some because they are very powerful. So there are some more advanced um, Facebook things that I haven't covered here because, well, it's not really the right forum in which to, to 
So look at these things. So there's Facebook advertising, the analytics that you were talking about, uh, monitoring tools. There are various tools that you can connect to your Facebook account, which will not only tell you how big your account is and how much people are liking it, but it will analyze the kind of language that's being used to talk about your brand on social media, both on your page and more widely across social media. I will track sentiment. So it will tell you that people like your brand, or they don't like your brand, or in the last week, positive sentiment for your brand has increased by X percent. Um, all very useful, but quite advanced. Then there's ways to connect Facebook to external, external sites. I'm sure you've all been on sites that say log in with Facebook. If you're even moderately technically capable, it's not that hard to do. Um, so these are all further things like tips for further reading. Basically. And then there are applications on Facebook as well. Um, applications on Facebook. Probably the only really good idea for those people who purchase it to throw around. They're, um, they're expensive and probably less than one in five of them works. Um, but when they do work, they more than pay for themselves. Because generally with an application, you get that thing of owning a relationship because you get an email address, you get the contact details. So it, it builds all to value. But you have to have enough budget try several, knowing that they might not do anything for you, they might not take off, even though they're quite expensive. So, um, it, it's probably not something to think about until you've mastered all the other stuff. So now, I'm going to have a slightly briefer look. Just um, at this point, it's after lunch, it's hot, um, some people are getting a bit tired, I know that I goes off in sessions like this. We just take a very brief moment to all stand up. And then reach up the sides. Okay? And relax. And then if you can all find someone that you didn't previously know, Going into this. What's that? Find someone that you don't know before the course of this event and introduce Anywhere near as many users in, in, in India or globally. 
Um, people don't tend to build friendships through Twitter so much. They tend to build more um, relationships around information or professional relationships. Not quite like LinkedIn, but um, it's more about sharing expertise. There are also things that go viral where people will share funny things. And there are the most followed people on Twitter are almost all celebrities and pop stars. But for me and you, Twitter is about sharing expertise. And what it does have is these influential users. So you have celebrities, you have journalists, and you have the main experts. And the, most in, the two most important here are the journalists and the domain experts. So I, have you noticed when you read the media, and there's any talk about campaigning or something online, they, the journalists mention that such and such a person involved in this event tweeted about it. The current conflict that's happening in Gaza, you've got a Twitter war going on between the Israeli Defense Force and Hamas, where the Israeli Defense Force is tweeting live updates of which targets they get, and Hamas is tweeting back tweets about um, you know, at Israeli Defense Force, we are opening the gates of hell. And it's kind of, it's, and the media is lapping this up. Like, kind of, they're talking about a new kind of um, PR war that's happening through Twitter. And the reason they're doing this is because journalists are lazy. So, what they do is they're on Twitter, they're on a certain, they want to write about a certain area. And they just follow the Twitter streams. And they get up to the day, up to date information so they can break stories quicker than the other journalists and therefore be better than the um, So they say a lot about things that happen in Twitter. So one very important thing that you do on Twitter is find out who the journalists are that you want to make this. Get them on your Twitter feed. If you get 20 of them on your Twitter feed, and you only have 20 people on your Twitter feed, I guarantee you that will have a bigger impact than if you get 100,000 people on your Twitter feed. Because those people will then write about you with me, and that will amplify your message. It's the same... Uh, uh, how does it actually work with anybody who see, that's on your feed receives the message of matter? Yeah. But then most of the proof that they are on your feed? Yeah, people have to follow you. So the, the idea is go out and find these people and find a way to make them follow you. Also, most of the, um, Can you repeat which people? The journalists okay. and the main experts. And the kind of everyday people on Twitter, <coughs> you follow loads of people and your messages will get lost in amongst everything else. Whereas the journalists are paid, you know, to troll through this stuff and find relevant information. They're not doing it for fun, they're doing it to feed themselves and buy themselves a house. So they will look through and they will find your information and if it's relevant to them, they will write about it. Uh, the domain experts are slightly different. They're kind of semi-professional people. They don't do this necessarily for a job, but they really care about it. So you can have people who, um, they, work in a, they work in a bank day to day, but in the evening, they're an animal rights activist. And they know a lot about it. They've volunteered for maybe five or ten organizations in the past ten years. They've um, you know, attended events like this. They've been to lectures. They've read up about it. They may be run a blog. Um, those people, they're very important people. Because again, they will amplify your message. And you won't have to explain to them what the issue is. They'll just go, oh, guys, you're working on this as well. Brilliant. I'll help you out. And they can help they can help you out simply just by retweeting your content. So they're very good to identify. Um, and if you get the opportunity to find celebrities who will pass on your who, who will pass on your Twitter information for you. That's good. Because they have huge, huge, millions of people. 
And so, again, if you're trying to drive traffic to your website, if you can get celebrities to tweet those links for you, you've just probably increased your reach by a million dollars. So, if there's ever an event, I mean, there are, there are a lot of celebrities who love animals and love to be seen loving animals as well, because it's very good for their brand image. So if you can ever get into contact with anyone like that, use them. You know, their their you know their 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 currency is their thing. And if they can do something with that that's positive and makes them feel good about themselves, they'll do it. You just have to ask them. You might have to ask them repeatedly and they might forget, but it's a very useful thing to be able to do. So how do you find these people? I'm not talking about the celebrities, we all know who the celebrities are. Um, so how do we find these domain experts and possibly journalists? So a very, very useful tool called Quant. Has anyone heard of Quant? So Quant measures your influence on Twitter. So it tells me how many people are following you, how many people are retweeting you. Um, so your client score is based on your true reach, so how many people see your, um, see your tweets. Your amplification, so if you retweet someone else's content, how much more important does it become because you retweeted it? And who are you connected to in your network? And so I think my client score is about 15, because whilst at Greenpeace, we do, by my personal account, I basically just used to read from Greenpeace content. So it, it doesn't really do it. Um, but this is quite a good practice for for me too. The level at which you become someone really important in the Twitter world is fickle. So if you can find anyone with a client score of 50 in your network, then you need to be engaging them just like you would a journalist who wants to write about Because they're probably about as important in terms of how much they can amplify your message. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, how do you ask that? Actually, how many people are watching your post? Apart from your likes and comments, how do you know? And how many people are watching you? On Facebook? Yeah. Um, there were the metrics that... Sorry. My name was was saying earlier that tells you what your reach is and it tells you how much of it is organic and how much of it is viral and if you do pay to promote how much of it is paid. So that's that can tell you how many people have seen an individual post. On Twitter, um, I don't think there's an equivalent. Uh, but you can see how many people have retweeted your post. Which is often not that many. If you get more than 10 retweets, then you're probably doing something right. So, yeah, basically, anyone above 50, with a tweet with a cloud score of above 50, is going to be someone who's influential <coughs> on Twitter, and probably offline as well. And so you can use cloud to find that. So you can find that the people who are in your followers already. But you can do things like, I want to find someone who's an expert on um, air pollution in Delhi. You put in air pollution, you choose your location as Delhi, and it'll tell you the most influential people. And then you can tweet at them and say, hey, you seem to know a lot about this. We want to work on this. Um, these followers. So you can't direct message someone on Twitter until they follow you. Uh, so at first, your correspondence with them is going to be public. So you want to be careful not to be sending things to begging people, you're really influential, please help us. That doesn't look good. So you have to somehow try and catch their attention. But you can find them through this, and then you catch their attention, and then if they follow you back, then you can start communicating with them about how you can work together on a course that you both have a passion for. So I would say that that's the most, these are the most important things you can do with Twitter. It's not so much about building a community like Facebook. 
It's about finding these key people who can amplify your message. Um, we've got 25 minutes left. I think I was about to move into the Q&A, but oh, do you want to come up with the data uh, Since it's just kind of this one for us. Yeah, this one. So, uh, cloud, for example, is a normally good idea. It's a picture of like, Facebook and everywhere else where you have some kind of... Hey, who are you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I just lost you. What do you do? Uh, I work for company called Okay, fine. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, what is that? So this is very, very helpful. And as he said, I think about 50. Uh, so, you measure how influential you are in the community. For whatever reason, right? And, and 50 is a very really good story. Now, mine happens to be 65 because I'm involved in many different things. Oh, but it doesn't mean anything. It could be, as I said, subject specific. So, it's a yeah. candidate for me. The second thing I want to tell you that I think is interesting is it's fundamentally a text based. Uh, by and large, for yeah. sure. It is restricted to like SMS of 140 characters. So this is for people who want to have quick messages to go out uh, very, very, very fast. So for example, today I've been sending out from the Fiatro account, Fiatro uh, Twitter account, I've been sending out messages even from this very room. Right? So if you do want to follow Fiatro, you have a first problem to create a Twitter account, then you start following people. So you follow Fiatro India. So we are sending out the app or green piece or whatever it is mm -hmm. that you continuously get this the stream of information, which you can then retweet to others and that's how you make your friends in the community of the Thank you. Yeah, I um, neglected to touch on the basics of how Twitter works. Um, I'm sure that there are some people who, yeah, so that's important information. And, and you're right, yeah, how it does look at other things. I think that it's weighted towards your activity. So, I mentioned her. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's going to be gone. Uh, we spoke about how many posts, uh, posts are there today. So, the Twitter is the same. That's Wait till you can post a lot more than on Facebook. And there's a word there as well, right? There's a it's video. a character. It's 140 characters. 140 characters. So yeah, it's short and sweet. And generally, a shortened link to an article that discusses the, the issue in more depth. So yeah, earlier I was talking about only the relationship um, and how social media doesn't allow you to own the relationship. So with all this talk of evolution that we started off with, one thing that's worth remembering is that email is still came when it comes to online communications. But with email, you own data, and you can fundraise, and you can write people to petitions and actions much more easily. And it's, it's important to remember that you can't do just social media. You need to be trying to get data that you can own so you can continue that relationship. And for that, email is still the most important. I know a lot of people, especially in the younger generation, people under about 25 now, often don't have email because they just message each other through Facebook instead. So it's not often not until they get to um, their first job that they give them an email address. Some universities now are communicating with their students through Facebook rather than Email. I'm not sure if that's the case in India yet, but it's certainly the case in the UK where I come from and in the US. Um, and this is, it's weird to talk about a generational shift away from email when many of us are still just getting used to the fact that email is a generational shift. But it's coming through, but at the moment it's not, it's not there. And in terms of running your organizations, these people under 25, whilst you need to be cultivating them, they're not by showing our support. Here is a link to some of the way you can take action. And uh, once they take an action, then they can, they're prompted to share that information, either through email or through social media, to drive more people back. So you can gather that data and start building a database of people who are committed to your business. So, just a quick plug for something that we're doing at work. 
I'm sure you've all had to change. Who's had to change the whole world? Change the whole Change the whole world. Yeah. So, um, around about a year ago, uh, we started building our own version for environmental and um, issues in India, which is called Green Peace Extra. Here's um, a petition we're currently running to say, is anyone from Bangladesh? So you're aware that they're trying to concrete over five acres of our land to turn into a car park. So the, the head of the Walkers Association there sent a petition on the platform that we've got for the local environmental issues. Um, it's used for some animal rights stuff as well. So if anyone's interested in trying that out, um, it's a free tool that, that we've decided um, rather than Greenpeace just being the organization that runs lots of petitions, that there are people who care about lots of issues that are lying with our work all across the country, but we don't have the time or the resources to get involved in. But we have the expertise on how to set this up. So we, we've opened up for people to run their own, their own stuff. So, we, so you can build your email list yourself as part of this. Do you vet this? Pardon? Do you vet the petitions that come on there? Pardon? Do you vet them? Do we vet them? Yes, we do. We have a policy of only banning ones that are discriminatory against um, people on grounds of identity, um, gender, race, religion. Um, we will only promote ones, though, so the feature on the front page, ones which are in alignment with our environment. But if someone wants to run something on, you know, uh, safe, safer working conditions in a factory, we're not going to stop them doing that. We're just not going to try to. Um, are there websites that you talk about? There's so many conditions that keep on the web. How do you do it? You can sign them and then what are you supposed to see there? Who takes care of the conditions you follow to the web? So, what we have is we have a couple of members of staff who work with this platform. Um, they'll spot petitions coming through that are popular and relevant and aligned with what they're doing. And they'll advise people. Um, kind of, okay, so you're running a petition, have you contacted the media? Who are you delivering this to? So what we found at first, we've still been running this for a few months in a kind of not properly public way so far. What we found at first was that almost everyone wants to petition the Prime Minister and the President. And, and why would you do that about a lake in Mysore that needs to be in Why would you do that? The answer is you find out who's in charge of public works for that city and you petition them. Um, often, smaller targets like that, these kind of things can be much more effective. People at the top of the world, this is so bored of um, getting a petition like they talk. Here's a rack signatures that care about issue X, but they don't, they don't care. Whereas someone who's a bureaucrat in your city, wherever it may be, gets three or four hundred writings done about something and they start thinking this is important, I should do something about this before it becomes like a media story and people start talking about me in a negative light. I you know I don't want to be media in the uh, So actually small micro targeted global petitions do tend to actually bring that change. But you do need either you need to be an experienced campaign already then we will get, oh, okay, I see how this online tool fits into the wider set of tactics. Or you need someone to hold your hand through talking about media, talking about how you deliver the position, talking about who's the right person to talk So we do try and provide that. Um, obviously, as the platform takes off, we're not going to be able to do that for everyone. Uh, but at the moment, like I said, we haven't really gone public with it, so we've only got about 20 or 30 positions on the board. Um, okay, and then we just have, I think we just have 20 minutes to do a, so I'll leave up some of this information that you can copy down if you want. Then, yeah. Um, what is your opinion or Greenpeace's opinion on posting like the, the funny cat photos and stuff? Like, right? on one hand, at least speaking for my Facebook page, 
on one hand, I want it to be like quote unquote professional and only post things that are actually family done. Or, but then on the other hand, maybe you get a lot more pop shares and likes. So how do you how do you suggest finding a balance between if you if you're just posting pictures of kittens chasing walls or falling off chairs in common fashion, um, then you'll lose your alienate your core communities. They'll get shared a lot more, but you'll alienate your core communities. But if you just post a very serious content at the time, you'll not grow your community. So it's a balance. Half serious, I'd say half serious, alter someone else's content, and alter fun. So I know that like PDA in here, or PDA in general, has, it seems they've started posting more and more like just a few pictures lately, it seems. So. They work very well, but you can't just post a few pictures. And also, when you post a picture, you get, you can put some text above it. So you can post a picture and you can say something like, ah, oh, now we've got your attention. This is what we want you to know about. Here's a link to a petition to do something about it, or here's a link to an article that tells you more about it. But you've got their attention already. Another very useful thing to remember about if you post pictures, the text that you put there can be edited at any point. Whereas if you just post text, once you post it, if you made a mistake or you missed out the link, you have to delete it and post something else. So that's quite a useful tip to remember is that posting images means you can edit text. And my last question. Okay. Uh, first name is Jero. First name is Is there any open source application available to, you know, or to get these uh, supporters? Uh, or, uh, so, uh, yeah. See, uh, there, there are people who usually code for us. Code for us? Code for us? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they can have this polling system. Is there an open source of, uh, application for that? Open source application for Facebook? Not Facebook, it's like polling. It's like polling. You do kind of census like. Right. In the um, yes. Right. So if you want to to conduct polls on public opinion. Yeah. So, yeah, pro um, I mean, there's some that come with a bit of branding and advertising, it's just there to make set up. Or if you want to get into proper open source setup, in both Drupal and WordPress, there are good, strong um, open modules that you can use as well. So yeah, there are free polling applications. Application that they can have you on your server. Or you can use generally this one saying so WordPress and Drupal are the two from the standard bearers of open source content management systems. Both of them have multiple polling applications that you can plug into. Them. And that can be hosted on your own What WordPress. WordPress or Drupal. WordPress is a bit easier to set up. Drupal is more full featured, but um, it's it's trying to it's for the more tech. And me. Yeah. I took this sort of question. Okay. I want the attention of all of my friends. I'm just let me share my feelings, okay? I'm very popular in Facebook because I I share my dreams and fantasies. Yeah. Okay. I have a point in my mind. Supposing this animal, huh? If I write pebbles, you know, pebbles. Yeah. Two dogs they are talking to each other. In English, two dogs talking to each other. What? Why do you get food? In that rich family, there are functions, something like that. But today I have not got anything. I am totally hungry. Because I am moving around KFC or something like that. They are not giving me anything. And suppose one beats and some dog imagines. So he is a dog and he is a domestic animal. I am a street dog. Why is he cared for? Why I am not? Is there a racial feelings amongst animals also? That is, it exists in the human beings. It also exists in the animal world. Yes. He is a, that's, he is a dog, I am a dog. Yeah. Yeah. He is being totally cared with all everything, domesticated animal. Yeah. I am a street dog. Such kind of stories, if I share in Facebook, 
Yeah. Only drop my. Can any do you any of you like to tell me? I'm going to write pebbles, pebbles on Facebook. So, huh? Would you like it? Yeah. Supposing two dogs talking to each other. Yeah, I think that's that uh, hard getting stories. I got stone throwing, uh, and uh, me. I'm being born, but I'm cared for in a rich family. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. I think, idea. Um, it's my I idea. Think, yeah. I think kind of um, something else that works very well, which, which is pictorial content, is cartoons. Cartoons and comic strips have always worked well for to convey messages. I think how many political cartoons get in trouble, and it's because it's because of the impact that the visual has on the world. There's much more. It can have much more impact. Than a well researched scholarly book. Just a funny cartoon that points out the absurdity of someone in power or the absurdity of a situation can be very, very powerful. Last 10 minutes. Last 10 minutes, okay? Uh, um, how do you enter organization <coughs> use maybe uh, YouTube to that end? Use YouTube. Okay, so this is a whole different um, uh, session really on, on YouTube. I'll give you some very quick pointers on YouTube is that um, in terms of format, you've got to keep it short, no more than three minutes. Unless you're producing Coding 2012, which took them eight years to um, and they spent two years building a celebrity Twitter army to tweet that to the world. Um, if you're going to do it on that level, then brilliant, but otherwise, keep it less than three minutes, ideally 90 seconds. Make sure that your message is conveyed at least one time in the first 30 seconds, as that's the point where most people switch off. And again, the same goes, cute animals do really well. Um, pictures of animals, like information about animals in distress, again, also tap into very strong emotions. And if you can, use annotations. So you know those boxes that pop up on YouTube? So use those to put in links to other information or put in calls to action. Make sure that in the description of your video you link back to your, your main web property. Um, other things that you can do is find more popular videos on the same issue or on a related issue and you can, um, you can post as a video response there. There's no guarantee they'll accept it, but if they do, that's very, that's very useful for you. And again, have fun. Our most successful video that we've ever done is from the New was um, we have these two characters, a tiger and a bear, um, being dressed up in costumes. So everyone knows the Color AD video. So we hired a recording studio for an afternoon and filmed people in tiger and bear costumes pretending to play instruments along to that song. It took five hours to do. Um, in the end, the guy in the recording studio had so much fun doing it, he didn't charge us. So the total cost of making the video was 2,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen by a lot of people. And we didn't even commit it. We just stuck it out there to ride on the way of what was happening in the world. Um, whereas we've done some where we've spent large budgets with production houses, a um, couple of months of planning, a month of production. And it's been seen by one person. So fun is one of the most important things. I'm trying to ride on the way of something that's out there. So if any of you can think of a way to do, um, to make Gangnam Style relate to the animal rights issue that you're working on, you'll be on to a <laughs> So anyone who has to ask a question already? So, well, Facebook and Twitter are the, are the two main ones. LinkedIn is very powerful for finding um, people who, uh, who have a professional interest in what you're doing. It's also very good for finding people who are likely to be donors. Because people who use LinkedIn are generally uh, many times rich 
than the people of India is the other such matters. So India is now number two in the world for LinkedIn. So for LinkedIn. Um, other social networks that are, that are worth looking at, we mentioned YouTube already, um, but something that's really growing at the moment is one called Pinterest. Has anyone heard of Pinterest yet? Pinterest. So again, that's to do with the fact that people like to share pictures. So I think as an animal rights organization, we'd be able to, to do very well with Pinterest. Yeah. Yeah. Be Pinterest. Pinterest. Be Pinterest. So um, that's um, something that you, you, you basically just post pictures with descriptions, nothing else. That's the interest? Yeah. Just the interest. Yeah. Um, what percentage of the online petitions really work? What percentage of them really work? I really want that they work. Um, as with almost anything in campaigning, it's just a tool. It's not um, a question of whether it works or not. It's not because it's online that would say whether it works or not. It's about picking an appropriate target, having an appropriate ask, and reaching out to the right community to take action. For example, um, we know someone who was running who was um, in campaign against the toxic waste um, issues in Java for about three for about three years. Hadn't made any headway. The local government seemed to be complicit with the company that was producing the toxic waste. And he set up a small, small online petition. And by the time 20 people had signed it, the company had come to him and offered him 20 lakhs to take it back. Because they were terrible. And that only took 20 people. And now the court is resolving all of this, and the company's going to be forced to clean it. But three years previously, before we started the petition, no one took any notice. And it only took 22 minutes. It was just the fact that they suddenly realized people in the outside world are going to know about this, and they're going to shine the spotlight on what's going on here, and um, we can't buy our way out. I'll come back to you in a I just uh, wanted to uh, get directly from the bottom of You people read the email phone message and ask us to read who of the call. Yeah, that's um, one of the other tools and tactics that we use. Right. Uh, is it really, uh, you know, useful in enforcing uh, policies or anything, whatever you are doing? Like, you know, you recently it was created, you recommended the area to stop to cut out the carbon. So we've now taken that forward and had meetings with us. But the idea behind that is when you're attacking a brand, um, you need to show that a large enough pe group of people are concerned for it to be a potential risk to their business for them to not do anything about it. And so when it comes to that, it is just a number It's just a case of going to them half a million people with this. And then they go, oh, half a million people, that's, you know, we should take that as the, the actual petition itself there um, is more symbolic of the fact that it shows that so many of the customers care about this. Okay. Yeah, so it works more with the uh, corporates. With corporates, if you're trying to do um, a brand attack, they big numbers for us. I think we've got time for one last question. Last one. Last one. Okay. I was wondering whether you can say something about overloads. Like, I personally get more than 100 emails a day, even if there's some really important ones, even if they have a great section subject line. I need some of them if I'm sitting in the conference today. Yeah. Um, I have set up different email accounts to be directed between newsletters, animal, my work, and so on. What do you, how are you going to do for that? Well, my point of view being on the receiving end, I don't have the answer. I basically just don't read most of the emails. From being on the sending end, I would say send the emails relevant and make sure that you don't send big long newsletters that take half an hour to read. Send short, snappy updates that give people only the key points in the first paragraph and then tell them what action. Otherwise, people will go first to wrong. 
I know it's a dumb one. Have you ever done that thing where you tell yourself you're going to come back to an email when you've got time? Have you ever gone back to any of those emails? Yes. Okay. It's almost the same as deleting. So if you make it so long that someone goes, I'll come back to it when I've got time, they may as well have deleted it. Yeah. Okay. You think of all the Yep. Twitter is very good for this because it's, because it's so short. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can, uh, this one looks interesting, although it's not really interesting. But yeah, if you send out bigger on emails, you will just pop up with the Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. To, um, to email me. If I'm not suffering from email, I will respond to you. I, do have a, I am part of a larger team, so I may be able to pass you on to someone else in the team who can help you. Um, but it's always great to be able to work with other organizations. I think we're stronger as a movement than as individual organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.